Hello, I'm Harley Schlanger with our weekly dialogue with Helga Zepp-LaRouche. It's January 13th, 2022. Uh, we're in the midst of a, a diplomatic showdown, a, a week of meetings. It started on Monday with the Geneva event of the U.S.-Russia Strategic Stability Dialogue, continued with the meeting yesterday of the Russia NATO Council and a meeting today with the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. There's a lot that's come out of this, most of it pointing to the fact that very little seems to have changed, at least publicly. The Russians went in with a, a couple of very clear uh, intentions, namely security guarantees, uh, legally binding treaties to stop the expansion of NATO uh, eastward, uh, and also to prevent Ukraine from being turned into a frontline battleship against the Russians. Uh, so far, it looks as though the U.S. is sticking to their insistence, at least publicly, that they will not accept Russian red lines. So, Helga, with the meeting still going on today, what's your assessment of what's come out of this so far? Well, I think it probably takes a couple of more days to find out more if there is something which is not public, which mostly in these meetings naturally, uh, you know, occurs. But if you go by what is publicly known so far, it looks terrible because Putin had said very clearly that, um, you know, the United States must guarantee uh, that there is no NATO expansion eastward because this is a fundamental threat to the national security interest of Russia and also, uh, you know, Ukraine cannot become a member to which the answer was uh, completely um, clear from Wendy Sherman, from Stoltenberg at these various meetings that, you know, that nobody can deny the right of a, a country to apply for NATO membership, that the doors are open, that nobody can kick the door closed. Um, in any case, you know, it's very clear that there is no intention uh, from the side of either the United States or NATO uh, to sign such uh, treaties uh, demanded by Russia uh, in the near future or even consider it. Um, and that creates a real problem because, <clears throat> you know, what, what is really at issue here is that this is an, a blatant assertion uh, for world dominance, to remain with the unipolar world, to only take care of the so-called security interest of the United States and its allies, NATO members, or even, you know, countries like Ukraine, but completely ignore the security interest of Russia and of China and many other countries uh, who are just being bullied uh, to submit to this unipolar world conception, which has ended a long time ago. So I think we are in, a, in an extremely dangerous situation. Uh, naturally, you have all the hawks uh, who are talking up uh, <clears throat> that, you know, Russia will invade Ukraine in a few weeks. You know, you had even uh, Avril Haines already pre briefing NATO a couple of months ago that no, January, February, the Russians would invade Ukraine. Now, the reality is quite different. Um, there is a lot of freak out about the so-called massing of, U of Russian troops on the Ukrainian border. Now, first of all, Russia has emphasized all the time that they can do with their troops on their own territory what they want. It's a sovereign country and they can move their own troops to, you know, wherever they, they want within their territory. Secondly, it is now uh, coming out from various uh, analysts uh, and, and Russian experts and uh, the like, that sure, Russia did bring about 100,000 troops along the uh, Ukrainian border, but this was after Russia had clear intelligence that more than half of the uh, Ukrainian uh, armed forces had gathered uh, around the line of the Donbas. 
uh, being also equipped with uh, weapons, you know, from the United States, from from Great Britain, uh, and it, that there was an absolute concern, you know, that the Ukrainian armed forces, which are not necessarily directed by President Zelensky, but you know, you have you have elements in that government which are quite, uh, you know irrational and, and and linked to the Bandera networks, uh, these people are, you know, quite capable of either, you know, attacking Donbass, trying to reconquer it, which, you know, would be uh, the immediate case for Russians in Donbass to call for help. And then Russia might be tempted and have no other choice than to come to the defense of these Russian people in Donbass. Uh, or some other provocation. So after Russia found out that, you know, such a large amount of the Ukrainian troop was at the Donbass uh, line, you know, they started to amass these troops, troops in, in, uh, at the Ukrainian border. And that remains basically the situation. So, you know, I think that we need urgently a change in the situation because this is a very explosive uh, situation which can, you know, get out of control at any moment. And um, I think nothing so far has been accomplished. I mean, there are people who are saying it's good that people are still talking. Naturally, it's better to talk. But if you look at the overall posture of NATO, of the United States, uh, the deputy foreign minister of Russia, uh, uh, Grushkov also uh, said that there is a big concern in Russia about the lowering of the nuclear threshold by the modernization of the nuclear armed forces in Europe, which makes the use of nuclear forces, you know, more likely. I mean, the only really positive thing which happened in the recent period was when the permanent five nuclear powers of the UN uh, Security Council all agreed that they would stick to the famous uh, verdict that nobody can win a nuclear war and therefore nuclear weapons must never be used. Uh, that is good, but does that mean an ironclad uh, guarantee that this will never happen? I think it's important that, that uh, <clears throat> Deputy Foreign Minister Rushkov, uh, Khrushchev, after these talks, expressed the same concern about uh, the lowering of the threshold uh, of the use of nuclear weapons, because you know, as long as you have these nuclear weapons deployed, um, you know, especially if it would come to a conventional war, uh, which um, you know, I mean, Russia would would clearly win. I mean, it has all the logistical advantage, uh, and if you look at the time NATO would require to to deploy as compared to the extreme swiftness with which Russia could move. You know, I think if it would come to war and Russia would win such a war, I mean, it should never happen. But if it would come to that, then the temptation uh, to, you know, to, to still use nuclear weapon, I, I do not rule out at all. And that would be the end of civilization, because once you start using nuclear weapons, uh, it is the logic of nuclear war that all the weapons would be used. That would mean, you know, the extinction of civilization. So I can only say the outcome of these meetings, from my perspective, is more than worrisome. And, you know, the m mainstream media, they don't report much about it at all. And, you know, I, I'm extremely, I'm extremely alarmed. And I think so should you all be. Well, Grushko, who you mentioned a couple times uh, in his briefing last night, said that the policy of the U.S. and NATO is to revert back to a Cold War policy of containment. And he said, Russia is left with no option but to respond to this. Now, there's a lot of speculation. What do they mean? What would Russia do? Uh, it's Biden himself said the United States would not get involved in a war in Ukraine. But as you say, surprises or uh, shocks can occur once you get engaged in fighting. Uh, how, how is it that the NATO 
and U.S. forces can come into a discussion like this with this air of superiority uh, and assert, continue to assert that we represent the rules-based order and you must obey. Obviously, they're missing the fact that the West has increasingly become weakened financially, economically, while Eurasia has become more unified. I mean, how is it that they're missing this? I think it's the arrogance of power. Um, you know, I think so far, you know, in the most of the post-war period, the U.S. could move the way they wanted to because they were the dominant power. And, you know, they feel that they won the Cold War, which is ridiculous because, you know, I mean, nothing was really resolved with the end of the Cold War. As uh, John Paul II correctly noted, that, you know, the West should not think that they were morally superior at the end of uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and he said, look, if anybody doubts why I'm saying that, look at the condition of the third world. And then you see, you know, that there is no moral superiority of the liberal system. And I think that idea that they won the, this, uh, the Cold War and that they can, you know, they proceeded then with this completely, um, you know, illusionary assumption that the end of history had come, that every corner of the world would become democratic according to the Western liberal model. And, you know, that they could just push away any regime which would be in the way through color revolution, through regime change, through, you know, uh, warfare, you know, make war uh, against all countries of the so-called axis of evil, as it was uh, said by Bush at one point, you know, and, and that way you get rid of all countries which do not submit and then you have an unipolar world. That did clearly not work. You have a tremendous backlash. First of all, you already mentioned the most important aspect, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is really very much in the same spirit like what uh, Lyndon LaRouche and myself have been pushing since the end of, or actually at the end of the, sec of the Soviet Union, uh, the proposal was for a Eurasian land bridge uh, to become the beginning of the new Silk Road and the new Silk Road becoming the world land bridge. So that policy is right now economically the most dominant in the world. Uh, if you look at the growth rates of China, you know, they're very, very impressive, especially if you compare it to those of the transatlantic sector. But also in respect to military aspects, you know, China is now becoming a still small but important nuclear uh, force with hypersonic missiles. Russia, uh, which uh, through the uh, lessons out of what happened to Russia in the 90s under Yeltsin um, with the shock therapy and so forth, total collapse of the demographic curve. When Putin came in, and that's why they really demonized Putin so much, he said this has to stop and he started to you know, reverse that. Uh, and especially in the military field, Russia is now back to be a world player and not a regional player as Obama uh, so uh, contemptuously uh, try to, uh, you know, put, put Russia in a second place. Now, Russia uh, is uh, conveying that they have the most modern uh, armed forces in the world. So, and, you know, because of these demonization uh, campaigns against both Putin and Xi Jinping and Russia and China in general, you have now a very, very strong, close friendship and partnership alliance between Russia and China, uh, with Russia having a technological advantage in the field of, of the military. So for NATO to play around with that is really playing with fire. And, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's just that they can't, they can't somehow agree to the idea that the United States should be primus in uh, under, in the paris you know the the maybe the first one but you know among equal countries and you know basically every country having a equal right of sovereignty and create an alliance and a, a partnership of sovereign nations 
at, that is what we have to get at. But that is, you know, obviously contrary to the military industrial complex in the United States. And we were told by a knowledgeable person recently who said it doesn't matter, you know, coming from this military industrial complex, who said it doesn't matter if we win or lose as long as the contracts are coming, you know, and there is a large amount of irrationality in all of this, but that, you know, again, is a, is a, is a big danger because if you're dealing with people who are so consumed by, you know, their position and their privilege and bully people around the world, you know, th this can go awfully wrong. And, you know, unfortunately, if it comes to the ultimate catastrophe, there would not even be a historian afterwards to report about it because nobody would be left. That's what these people are playing with. Now, Helga, one of the points that you and your husband, Lyndon LaRouche, made repeatedly is that this whole uh, strategic conflict is shaped by the demands of the city of London and Wall Street, the global financier interests uh, who are insisting on continuing to be able to loot the world, but to do what? To, to prop up their bankrupt financial institutions. On the other side, we have the Belt and Road Initiative, <clears throat> excuse me, the moves toward Eurasian integration. Obviously, it would make sense to scrap this confrontation and look for cooperation. But I, you, you've recently raised the whole question of whether or not NATO should continue to exist. How, how would you look at this today? Well, I mean, for Germany, for example, or, you know, most European countries and even for the United States itself, to be in an alliance, which if it comes to war, would mean the extinction of all of its members is not exactly a rational choice. Now, the United States may think that because they are <clears throat> a large island and, you know, that they are many miles away from Europe and the, what they consider the potential theater of war, you know, there may be the illusion. But I think if it comes to war this time, you know, it would, it would be a global war, including the United States. For Europe, for Germany, it would mean within the first minutes of the conflict, Germany would cease to exist. So I think what we need is a very serious debate. Does it make sense to be in a military alliance, which if it comes to military conflict, which is what a military alliance should protect against, you know, you cease to exist. I think we should, uh, you know, reflect on that because when the Warsaw Pact dissolved in 91, essentially NATO should have dissolved. Uh, because it lost its uh, raison d'etre, um, you know, the enemy was no longer there. Uh, we proposed a peace order at the time in the form of the Eurasian land bridge. But, you know, there was even a period where there was a long consideration to even include Russia into NATO or to change the security alliance in such a way that it would accommodate the new situation. And I think we have now very seriously a situation where we have to replace NATO with a new security architecture, which guarantees the survival and security interest of all. I mean, if you look in the history of such um, alliances or treaties, one can see very clearly only when the security interest of all was taken into account did it have a lasting uh, you know, impact on peace? When it was not the case, it led to war. The two most famous examples of this is obviously the Peace of Westphalia, where after about 150 years of religious war in Europe, and more particularly the 30 years of the 30 years war, you know, it was clear that nobody would enjoy the victory if the war would continue because there was, you know, in parts, one third of everything was destroyed. In other areas, half of everything was destroyed. Houses, villages, people. So then in the four weeks, uh, four years of the negotiation of the Peace of Westphalia, basically the previously warring parties agreed on principles which would guarantee a durable peace. And 
you know, the Peace of Westphalia is still a very important uh, precedent for what we should be doing today. The principles were that for the sake of peace, you have to forgive all what was done by the one side or the other. Um, then the second principle, for the sake of peace, you have to take into account the interest of the other. And that is a very, very important principle because you cannot, you cannot continuously have peace if you ignore blatantly the security interest of one or more of the, uh, of the uh, relevant uh, countries. Now, where it was not considered was famously the Versailles Treaty, where contrary to the reality of what was leading to World War I, Germany was given the guilt, you know, to be the only guilty party. They had to pay enormous war preparations, which the Reichsbank then solved with printing money that led to the hyperinflation that then you had the depression. And then out of all of this, you had the second world war, which was sort of the next chapter, you know, of the first world war. So the Versailles Treaty, you know, is really what people should, should think about, because if you don't take into account the interest of, in that case, Germany, you know, that led to the rise of the Nazis, that led to the right, left street fighting, you know, the total collapse and naturally the economic conditions. So what we need today, therefore, if we consider this, that we need a security architecture which does take into account the interest of everybody. And that it emphatically includes Russia. It emphatically includes China. Um, and therefore, you know, I think that given the fact, um, you know, I believe since a very long time that you can, with this complex mess which we have as a strategic situation, that you cannot take a partial problem and think you can solve it maybe for a short period of time, but that because we have a collapse of the neoliberal financial system, it's a question of time, you know, we have a hyperinflationary blowout going on right now. Um, you will see enormous disruptions because of the energy price, the food price, we have famines, we are threatened with the danger of social chaos. Um, you know, so we need a solution which really addresses all of these problems at the same time. And it just happens to be that was what was developed by my late husband, Linda LaRouche for many years is what is still the illusion, uh, the solution. So what we need is a reform, a reorganization of the bankrupt financial system. We have to get rid of this massive speculation, which is hot air in any case. And you know, just because billionaires have become billionaires, that doesn't mean the real economy is not collapsing and many people become poorer and poorer and billions of people are starving. So we need to change that, have a global class legal uh, system, go back to Hamiltonian national banking, and then have a new credit system in the form of a new Bretton Woods now, that only can be agreed upon on the top level of maybe the G20. Maybe that's the gremium we should call on an emergency basis such a reorganization. Then we need, you know, the uh, economic cooperation among nations, which what is the obvious framework for, uh, would be that Europe and the United States cooperate with the Belt and Road Initiative um, in the development of Latin America, of uh, those parts of Asia and Europe, which are not yet developed, uh, a reconstruction of the U.S. economy, which is very urgent. The U.S. is in a terrible state of collapse. Uh, the urgent development of, of Africa and Southwest Asia. So there's plenty uh, for these countries to cooperate. And uh, I think it was Chess Freeman who recently said, you know, so what if the Chinese are building railroads? Let American trains uh, use these railways. Uh, if, they, if the Chinese build a highway, let American cars drive over those highways. In other words, you know, just because China has already engaged in the Belt and Road does not mean that other countries should not cooperate. 
I mean, just think about the enormous the problems we have to solve, you know, the development of Africa, the overcoming of the worst humanitarian crisis, not only in Afghanistan, but also in Syria, in Yemen, you know, in Iraq, many, many other countries. So what we should do is we should put the Belt and Road Initiative on the table in the form as we proposed it, namely the new Silk Road becomes the world land bridge, agree with long-term economic cooperation agreements to engage in these projects, which would transform the world you know, and make it a livable place for, for every country and every person on this planet. And then take that economic cooperation as the basis for a new security architecture, which would not just take care of NATO's interest, but which would include you know, security guarantees for Russia, China, and every other country. I mean, this is feasible. It's rational. It's, you know, it would, it would solve all problems at the same time. And, you know, the question is, can mankind take a solution which is so obviously needed and, you know, just requires a few people who have a vision uh, who have the courage to come forward in a in a moment like this, and um, I think you know that is what we should mobilize the population for because that is the clear alternative to the extinction of the civilization. We we just have a few more minutes, and I want to get to a couple of different issues. <clears throat> One of which is that those people who say that Russia is bluffing, Russia is uh, going to back down. I think they should look at what happened in Kazakhstan in comparison to what was done by Russia in 2014 with Ukraine. But this looks like it was an organized color revolution to distract and, and divert Russia's attention. Uh, the Russian troops went in. It appears as though the situation is calm there now. Yes, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I think the Russians are so um, you know, determined not to allow any more color revolution. Putin commented the events in Kazakhstan by saying this was uh, done with the Maidan technologies, meaning, you know, NGOs um, then making demonstrations. I mean, in part, it was triggered by the uh, liberalization of the price of uh, energy, which they are now have reversed which was a stupid advice to follow. Um, but then that organic ferment, so to speak, was used by NGOs, which a lot of financial support from the West. And then you had terrorist elements flown in from Syria, ISIS, you know, exactly as it was done at the Maidan. So, you know, since the Russians and obviously the Kazakhstan government recognized that, they immediately called in the military alliance of SESTO, and within a very short time, the uprising was uh, squelched, and um, you know now relative peace has uh, uh, been reintroduced. But just think about it: that the same forces which did the coup in in Kiev in 2014, in the days before these important meetings in Geneva, Brussels, and Vienna, uh, you know they try to to do a color revolution in Kazakhstan. I mean, if the Russians and the Chinese do not conclude from that, that the final aim of these forces is regime change in Russia and China, then they would really not be thinking clearly. But obviously, they have come to the conclusion that that is exactly what it is. And therefore, uh, they will not uh, give in one iota. And Putin said in a meeting of the members of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, there will be no more color revolutions. Now, let's take up the Afghan situation where there's uh, been nothing substantial done to transform the, the country, uh, even to provide humanitarian aid. Uh, the Schiller Institute is sponsoring a conference on Monday, an emergency conference, Stop the Murder of Afghanistan. Uh, it would seem that this would be an ideal situation for Russia, the United States, and China to collaborate to solve a humanitarian crisis. Uh, 
what 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 are you planning for the conference and and uh, uh, people should register at the end of this uh, webcast should register to join it but what are the plans that we have for it well we will first of all take a, a very uh, sober review where we stand almost five months after the Taliban took over in in uh, Kab Kabul in uh, mid mid August because you know what now has emerged is really an ugly picture because uh, everybody knew that when the Western donor countries cut off the aid to Afghanistan because of the Taliban takeover, they, they immediately gave the death blow to the Afghan economy because 75% of the budget came from these donor money. So if you cut off the money, you know, immediately you collapse the economy, no cash, people have no money to even import food, even if they have a little money. So now as a result, you have the worst humanitarian crisis uh, on the planet with, uh, you know, immediately 8 million people in the process of starving, as we are talking now. That, that has been stated repeatedly by the United Nations, by the World Food Program. And, you know, you have the danger of 24 million more people dying this winter. And the UN just required uh, at least 5 billion to immediately stop this. You know, nothing has happened much yet. A little bit has occurred, yes, mainly from Russia, from China, Pakistan, uh, Iran, some neighbors in Central Asia. So we will review the situation. We will have many Afghan uh, experts, people who are Afghanis, uh, and we will review the situation and then come out with a, an action plan to really arouse the conscience of the world to change that with what I call Operation Ibn Sina. Now, what is needed is the immediate uh, you know, remedy of a medical crisis. We have COVID, we have uh, people have no access to medicine, and Ibn Sina was the a uh, you know, great physician living a thousand years ago, who is one of the absolute greatest physicians in the history of mankind, together with people like Hippocrit, Galen, uh, and you know, he, he developed the whole canon of medicine, which was the standard work for 600 years, even in Europe, until the 17th, 18th, even 19th century. And you know, he is one of the greatest thinkers of all times. Um, and he comes from this region. His father was born in Bak, which is in um, you know, northern Afghanistan. He himself was born in Afshana, which is where his father married his mother near Buhara. This is Uzbekistan today. And for all the people of this region, Ibn Sina is one of the absolute admired heroes of their own history. And I want to rally uh, the support for Afghanistan, the first the medical question, but then more largely the economic reconstruction in his name, because I think the Afghan people have suffered so long because, you know, they are geographically in a very important place where the British, uh, you know, decided that their great game had to be launched now for, you know, centuries, one can can, can say. And therefore, the Afghan people need a symbol of hope that they will have a bright future. So if you want to help, uh, then become part of this mobilization of Operation Ibn Sina to save the Afghan people. They have suffered 40 years of war just in the recent period. Can you imagine two generations living under wartime conditions? And, you know, many women are dying. They have their dying babies in their arms, you know. So if you are concerned about women's rights in Afghanistan, then help us to save the life of people because without them living, you can forget about any right because dead people tend to have very few rights, at least their body has. So um, that will be 
the subject, we will discuss the philosophical ideas of Ibn Sina more, which is very exciting. Um, and, um, you know, if you have any heart in your body left, then join this campaign. Because, you know, I think that if the West cannot mobilize its uh, resolve to help to resolve a situation which we caused, I mean, we, the West, NATO was there for 20 years. If we cannot solve that, the whole world will look at the West with complete contempt. So there is a last chance, you know, to 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 reverse that by, you know, joining hands now with all the neighbors and uh, including emphatically Russia and China. But the Europeans and the United States are called upon the most because, you know, if, they, if we can't do that, then I think this will be the symbol of our demise and we must not allow that to happen, but we must take that as the turning point in history. And as you just said, this would be a very powerful flank on what otherwise is developing as a powder keg around Ukraine. So that's this coming Monday, January 17th. It will begin at 11 a.m. Eastern time, and you can register for the online seminar at the theschillerinstitute.com. So Helga, we've, we've covered a lot. I think there's going to be more coming up on the uh, on our websites. Uh, people should stay in touch, uh, be regularly involved with what we're doing, find out what we're doing and, and what you can do to help. So Helga, thanks for joining us and we'll see you again next week. Till next week.